Yeah, great. Thank you so much for the for the warm intro. I was thinking when you started to talk about authenticity in, in the sense of touch, I was like, was this planned? And then, yeah, really nice intro. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so I'm Andreas. Uh, quickly about myself. Uh, I've been living the last uh, 10 years in Helsinki, so I'm also super grateful and also thankful to ThoughtWorks, to the Creative Mornings Munich uh, for you know enabling me to, to come here. I've been now for five months in, in Munich and this is also super super cool opportunity for me to also you know get to know people, network um, and uh, yeah I'm a big fan of knowledge sharing but also I am a strong believer of you know knowledge being created in the sort of uh, intercourses and kind of you know interactions with with other people so um, I'm, I'm really excited to also you know um, share my thoughts here and even more so super happy to you know hear if it triggers any thoughts that you might have so more than anything I'm, I'm super um, looking forward to uh, to the upcoming upcoming discussion so yeah um, <clears throat> authenticity I'm gonna just check the watch quickly um, yeah uh, it's always uh, interesting when you think about a title and then when you kind of type it up um, it has a lot of like heavy words in it um, what I'm planning to walk you through in the next yeah plan is 15 minutes approximately uh, is to yeah share with you my thoughts on some of these topics, commodification and quantification, um, but also then where authentic experiences, um, in my opinion, should maybe even take a bigger role, um, particularly because um, of our, you know, digitalized, um, digitalized self and digitalized world we are we are in. Um, I'm just gonna open this here quickly to have some notes, so I'm not. And um, yeah, also I'm a service designer, I guess professionally speaking, I'm a service designer at, uh, at Futurize. I consider myself to be a latent activist, so also I like to, you to understand that I do have a, of course, subjective and opinionated um, sort of, uh, yeah. Um, thoughts that go into this presentation, but even more so, I'd be super happy to then, to then be challenged and see if some things resonate with you uh, in the upcoming. Uh, discussion. So starting with uh, the topic of digitalization. Um, so digitalization comes with a with a big promise of you know enabling us to have a multitude of different information access points um, of you know solving many of our wicked problems we have nowadays in our world and overall like a big big promise of also increasing ways of living, quality of life and productivity. Um, at the same time, also this translates to that our belief systems and how the way we look at the world becomes very much uh, sort of measurable and quantified. And one of the main questions um, that was also the trigger for you know thinking about this talk um, was: Do we as humans also still find a, with our needs and our individuality um, still find a place of existence in this um, quantified and measurable um, world? So, um, in a way, in, even though there is a multitude of opportunities and, and diversity, um, that's a big promise of digitalization, um, there's always the so-called uh, state-of-the-art thinking, um, which means that uh, we are also told, in a way, um, how we should behave, how we should be eating, and even how we should be sleeping, um, given the fact that there is so much information also uh, intruding <laughs> into our everyday life. So in a way, uh, there is all this sort of diversity and uh, multi-layeredness, but at the same time, I, I, I do think that we are also approaching to some extent a world of uh, unambiguity, so um, singleness, if you wish. Um, so that also is being, um, how to say, um, even strengthened 
by our sort of need as social animals to fit into our surroundings. And since we are living in this kind of omni-productive world where everything is about, you know, achieving, being efficient, being effective, um, we are also being drawn into this uh, stream of uh, trying to, you know, do our very best to deliver, to think about the next step, to think about the outcome in uh, everything that we do in our everyday life. And um, I, I, so in a way, there is this, you know, path that's being laid out. And uh, I want to share with you two very recent examples I've been reading. Um, in a way, to, I guess elaborate a bit on my point, but also maybe to provoke a little bit. Um, and the first example that I thought is, um, well, interesting, but also to my sort of way of looking at the world, very challenging, um, was this trend I've been reading about sleep tourism. And um, sleep tourism uh, uh, supposedly is becoming a, a new trend. So people um, going for and, and booking vacations for the purpose um, of, you know, finding better sleep. And um, there's whole resorts designed, um, including um, medical professionals and so on, um, environments designed for people to come, spend the time to find better sleep. And um, I think this is a little bit uh, challenging um, because even the very <laughs> sort of, uh, you know, intrinsic uh, need of human beings, meaning sleep, becomes uh, yet another sort of commodification in our also busy life. So where do we make sleep now fit into our everyday life? And um, when I then started to read a bit more about this uh, trend, there's of course critique also um, about this sleep tourism. But uh, interestingly enough, I think the, at least what I've been reading, the discourse that I could uh, find online happening about the critique didn't talk so much about the why even sleep tourism you know, is becoming a thing. But the main point of the critique was that, um, well, sleep tourism, yeah, it's happening. It's, uh, it's there because, well, in our everyday busy life, uh, there needs to be, you know, made space for, you know, finding time to rest and sleep. Um, and the main critique point was that it's, uh, these resorts are too expensive and they're not affordable enough so that not everybody could participate and enjoy this sleep tourism. And I thought that is really um, uh, challenging, I think. Um, and to an, to an extent also seeing that the discourse uh, of such topics as, you know, making sleep a, you know, um, quantified sort of part of your 24 hours um, is not being challenged but rather um, saying that okay how can we make this even more affordable to others I think that's a that's a challenge and um, yes so that's a challenge uh, the other example I, I brought today um, is uh, more now talking a bit of about authenticity um, rather than commodification. And um, this is also very recent, uh, I guess, uh, platform um, that I learned uh, about while having dinner. Um, someone was active in that particular platform and uh, that's how I le learned about it. And uh, this platform um, basically, if uh, I, I suppose nowadays many people are familiar with, with Instagram, um, and uh, this platform is uh, supposedly positioning itself to be a more authentic way um, compared to the sort of self-curated, uh, you know, avatar people have on Instagram. So what this platform does is uh, once a day randomly um, a user gets notified to now there's this two minute window uh, where you can uh, or encourage to take a picture of yourself um, in order to capture the um, kind of in the moment authentic uh, self um, that you can then share with your uh, with your peers and um, I think even though the ambition is to yeah move away from this curated self um, to you know capturing a more authentic or in the moment experience um, is at the same time I think really sort of 
playing into this, I think somehow like artificially even induced or, or um, exploited even um, need of this kind of self-staging and, and self-promotion of, of us as humans uh, nowadays. Um, so also, even though the intention is to, yes, share a moment um, that, uh, you know, you are in right now, um, it still makes one that uh, uses platforms like these um, uh, makes their in the moment experience become a purposeful act. What do I mean by that? Sort of a purpose driven that in the moment you're not thinking about the experience itself and your environment, um, but you have a purpose to actually share that moment with someone in order to get you know, feedback, input, um, get, uh, you know, envy, um, whatever, whatever you want. So this actual in the moment experience becomes rather shallow and only driven by, by a different purpose, um, sort of a means to an end to again, like, uh, become a more like commodified version of yourself in um, such platforms. So I think that's also, uh, one of the, one of the main um, challenges when talking about um, this commodification of, of oneself and how authentic experiences um, are also um, supposedly being encouraged but at the same time I think they're uh, hijacking experiences and making them rather shallow um, which in the end means the experience itself kind of implodes if you wish and becomes uh, solely a purpose purpose driven driven act. Um, uh, quick maybe sidestep to one of my uh, favorite philosophers. So we have a philosophical two minutes um, because there's this uh, American philosopher John Dewey and he talks about uh, aesthetic experiences and um, in his works he makes an interesting sort of argument or, or claim that uh, particularly these in the moment experiences are yeah, um, merely sort of acts in isolation and the actual experiences are based on sort of, uh, sort of a culmination of what happened in the past that then culminates or climaxes in a certain present. So all also the things, the context and your own sort of learnings, your own sort of struggles to come to a certain point um, really play a big part in having a sort of authentic experience or what he calls aesthetic experience in the moment and uh, heavily challenging this um, very snapshot of uh, things being uh, sort of uh, experienced in a certain point in time. And uh, the, the claim he makes is that uh, we, we should be, um, in order to have more aesthetic uh, experiences and uh, conscious experiences, um, we need to, first of all, uh, embrace that there has been also a path leading to a certain experience in terms of growth and also in the present uh, that's how he refers to conscious experience like really embracing that um, the present is also filled with uh, sort of possibilities about the future and uh, so his argument is that by considering and being conscious in the present, you see a lot of opportunities and possibilities in the future. However, nowadays we are many times a little bit anxious about the future. We see in the present something that is lacking, that we still need to achieve, uh, that we still need to buy. <laughs> um, I'm exaggerating a bit here, but there's this sort of part that is absent in the present, which causes also um, this, um, what I call it kind of purpose-driven um, enacting of an experience. So in the present, if you think that I need to achieve something, something is missing, um, I'm tasked to design a certain, certain gadget, certain app, um, that is all the time sort of hindering um, of really looking at the future in terms of uh, possibilities and opportunities, but rather um, sort of, uh, yeah, what he call kind of uh, subordinating it to, to a certain aspect which is missing that uh, again you then focus on and, and dedicate sort of your doings or your enacting to a certain uh, purpose. And uh, yeah, the sidestep I uh, wanted to take because I think that's also interesting when now moving a little bit towards organizations, design and innovation, um, which I want to 
continue talking about for the next five to ten minutes. And um, where on the one hand, I think, based on this uh, quote, um, I really want to highlight the kind of wish or the need I see personally um, <clears throat> for experimentation, um, especially in uh, early ideation of organizations. And I do see also there is a growing um, part of organizations that do apply explorative phases. But at the same time, when thinking about design, um, the explorative phases are all the time um, already driven by a certain purpose. Um, there is this, um, you know, either organizations um, have uh, sort of, again, coming back to this maybe state of the art, the way things are supposed to be, there are strategic objectives, so also very tangible sort of um, artifacts in organizations that uh, drive uh, also experimentation or exploration into certain directions. And um, I, I, I do think that also there's a need to really embrace also the openness of experimentation uh, and not guiding this in the early phases of, you know, idea creation and really also exchanging knowledge already into a certain um, funnel, uh, call it outcomes, call it objectives, um, call it market growth, <laughs> however you, how you want. Um, so I think there should be also this really explorative um, part. And um, to be kind of uh, polarizing here, um, I, I think we are still seeing too much of this in a way. And this is metaphorically, I, I hope no, no office literally looks like this anymore, but uh, metaphorically speaking, so there is, um, <coughs> you know, processes and also incentives for employees and structures in place in organizations that all have a purpose and that all give a purpose to the employees. Um, but I'm making the case here, I suppose, to also embrace the a bit more unguided um, experimentation in organizations. So instead of this, I want to share an example um, about a sort of junkyard playground. Um, nowadays called adventure playground. Um, the idea started in the uh, 1940s, uh, Denmark occupied by Nazi Germany and so on. So there was really a scarcity of places to play and to, you know, imagine things. Um, so in this little town called Emdrup, um, there was the idea of uh, using scrap materials um, and just having a space for children to build, construct, deconstruct, uh, take apart um, their own castles, their own slides. So the whole idea was to have a space which would be driven by kids to self-organize themselves. As adults, you might think, of course, this, you know, leads to havoc and sort of a chaos and nothing will work. And yes, that is what happened in the first couple of months. Uh, there was a lot of stealing, camp building between kids. There was, you know, keeping materials to themselves, um, you know, invading the other sort of fortress that was built. Um, but after a while, it, it adapted to a sort of uh, working system. And I, and I think um, just using this again as a metaphor um, to really also um, enabling experimentation and taking the time to also allow sort of um, new and interesting ideas to grow rather than putting them into a certain purpose-driven um, funnel um, quite early on. So um, I, yeah, maybe to come to a, come to a conclusion here. Um, uh, just this Tuesday, I, I received uh, uh, a newsletter that I thought uh, had this uh, image that I thought was kind of brilliant. And I was preparing you know, a little bit this and I thought that's, with all that I've been saying, this kind of brings it to the point. Um, so I think, in a way, coming back maybe to um, Dewey, the philosopher, if you remember. Um, so instead of, you know, being in the moment uh, for a purpose and seeing, maybe identifying opportunities, um, identifying, you know, user needs, observing, um, I, I think it's important to um, live those experiences um, to uh, kind of go out, uh, explore, uh, be also failing, 
maybe fail alone in your experiments, fail with others, you know, um, but come to a point where you start also, <laughs> in the end, hopefully falling in love with, with a, uh, an, an idea or a design that you want to really drive forward within an organization on your own and uh, kind of be also brave enough to kind of um, um, drive this uh, sort of uh, immersiveness with the, with the um, experienced world. And uh, yeah, uh, maybe as a very last note, before I'm really curious to hear your thoughts, just want to highlight that um, looking at all these things, there's always, you know, different perspectives to look at it. And I, and I still want to share two examples I thought is super funny. I love this retro futurism. And um, just to highlight that um, in uh, 1901 or between 1901 and 1910, um, this uh, artist Jean-Marc Coté <laughs> um, uh, did the visuals of how the year 2000 would be looking like. And I just want to make a disclaimer here that I'm quite subjective in the things I'm sharing and I have one sort of uh, way to look at it. And, and also here in 1900 was this kind of, uh, you know, looking at the future full of possibilities or is this also, you know, maybe some sort of criticism of standardization and so on. And the uh, same with the, with the second <laughs> example um, that artists <laughs> came up with. Uh, 100 y more years ago. Um, again, I think it's always a matter of looking at it from, from different perspectives. So I'm not saying that uh, we should be stopped doing purposeful, uh, purpose-driven designs. Um, but uh, the way I want to engage <laughs> with you today um, is that I still think we should have much more space for experimentation and stop um, being put into the state of the art how we should be doing things. Um, I here have just to share, um, be transparent, where I drew sort of my <laughs> inspiration um, for sharing my two cents with you today, um, if you're interested to read a bit more. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, with that, I'm ways over time, but uh, as I said in the beginning to someone, when a topic interests me, um, I tend to <laughs> uh, talk a lot about it, but now I'll be quiet for a bit and just happy to hear anything interesting or anything you know you fully disagree i'd be more than happy to have a conversation with you uh, thanks so much <laughs>